Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to each and every one of you. We're glad that you're here on behalf of our risen Lord and Savior, and I'd like you all to be at home and feel welcome. I'd like to worship and welcome you who are worshiping with us through the uh, website or our YouTube channel. We're glad that you're tuning in with us as well, and we pray that you will be blessed by this uh, gathering and worship service. A couple of announcements for the good of everyone gathered here. While they're being done, I invite you to pass and sign the pew pads and pass them down the aisle. Um, this is uh, done. If you are a member, just please write your name and that you're a member, that's fine. There's no need to write your address or email every time. However, if you are a guest, we'd love to have you fill out some information that we can send to you some further uh, follow up on what's going on in the life of the church. I want to say too, um, there's quite a, many good things happening here in the church, and uh, many of those things are highlighted in the bulletin, and I invite you to take a look at those uh, later, um, preferably not during the sermon. <laughs> want to say after church today, uh, well maybe, maybe that's the best thing going on in that moment, I don't know. Um, after church today, everyone's invited over to the chapel, where we're going to have a fellowship hour that's been hosted and sponsored by Sue McKendrick. Sandy Kaufman, and Stephanie McMahon. The other two things I really want to lift up and highlight, though, are next week we're having our spring workshop um, celebrating Earth Day. There's uh, quite a few um, crafts and theme ideas in the coat room for you and uh, for all generations, really, to sign up and be a part of. There's also pizza. I think that's coming from Tony's, so uh, that's really a good piece of pizza there, I think. And I invite you to sign up, even if it's just to come for the meal and fellowship. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, come and participate, and that's next week. And it's all sponsored by the church, so it's free for everyone to enjoy. The last thing I want to lift up is to say that um, next, uh, late next week, Don and I are going to be going to the state of Washington to see our daughter and her husband. And uh, the next two Sundays I will not be here. However, um, the Reverend Paul Jones, who's been with us before, will be here with us on the 21st. And then the Reverend Paul Cronin, who comes with his family on occasion to worship with us, will be here for the first time leading our worship service. And so we're excited about that. And I understand he's going to sing in the anthem for that day as well. So he'll be coming and practicing too. Is there anything else to be lifted up at this time? Seeing that there isn't, let us prepare our hearts as we prepare to worship God by listening to the prelude.
At this time, I invite you to rise as you are able as we worship God with our call to worship and opening part of the service. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. By faith we believe we have gathered in the presence of God, a holy God, and we're called to be holy people as individuals in the church of Jesus Christ, where we have failed to do that. When we've been less than holy, we need to ask God to forgive us. The good news is always that God will forgive us and cleanse us in Christ. Let us pray. O oh God, we confess to you how slow we are to hear, to see, to feel, to know, and to follow the signs of Christ risen among us. Pardon the sin of our disbelief, and wash us thoroughly with your grace, that as we approach this time with him here and now, we may be freed from our bondage to our self-determined barriers, and open to receive him who comes to make us in all things new. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, St. Paul reminds us that God was in Jesus Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Believe the good news of the gospel that in Christ Jesus we are forgiven. In Christ Jesus we are brothers and sisters of one another. In Christ Jesus we have the hope and promise of heaven. Let us give our thanks and praise.
just beautiful. And on that note, let us share the peace and love of Christ with one another. The peace of our Lord and Savior be with you all and one another. Amen. Pass the peace with fist bumps and shakes and smiles with one another.
At this time, let us rise as we are able to offer our praises and our offerings to God. Let us pray together. Eternal God, for creating us and giving us all that is necessary for life, for intervening in our foolishness with your judgment and grace, for refreshing us with the promise of Christ's likeness, for calling us into the household of faith and the body of Christ, accept, O oh God, the offerings we place on your altar. Amen. You may be seated and let the young Christians come forward. Good morning, good morning. Now, um, I have, well, there's a picture on the uh, bulletin today of a woman, right? Yeah. And uh, she reminds us in the Old Testament, or the first part of the Bible, that there were people called prophets. Prophets were, could be men, and sometimes they were women. And sometimes, we'll get into a little later, they were young people, a little older than yourself. And she had a special job. Her job was to tell Israel, or the people that were God's people back in those days, how to live. When they had questions upon, about how they should live, they went to people like her, these prophets, to say, what does God want us to do? How does God want us to behave? And... Um, we have people like that in our lives, don't we? That kind of tell us how to live and how to behave. Who might be someone who's like a prophet in our life? Yes, read. Your mom and dad, sometimes they have to share with you on how to live, right? Yes. Nora. Um, the, the parents that they have to Your pop up and Grammy, I like that. Nice. <laughs> Does anybody come to your mind that somebody might that tell us how to live, what's right and wrong? Help us which way to go? Hmm. Huh? Your teacher, yeah. Yeah. Your mom, yeah. Yeah. Your, your dad, yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Jesus, there you go. Jesus, and how do we learn about Jesus? When we come here to church, we learn about Jesus, right? When we go downstairs, we learn about Jesus. When we're at home, we're taught about Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. And, um, and there are people who fill that role. Another thing that I want to say, it's not just men and women, but it's also young people. There was a boy named Samuel, and he was about 10, 12 years old, not much older than you, and God called him to be a prophet to try and tell the people how to live. Are there times when maybe God wants you to share something with somebody, like a friend or a family member, on something that might be what's right or wrong? Do you think that could ever happen? Yeah. Maybe with a younger sister, helping Sissy out, yeah? Yeah. So maybe a schoolmate, right? Yeah, maybe even a parent every now and then. Sometimes we need straightened out once in a while too, yeah. But not pop up and grandmas, no. They're perfect. <laughs> so that's what I want you to remember today. A prophet is somebody who um, shares um, with others things that they need to hear. And sometimes 
uh, they might like it and sometimes they might not. Do we always like what we get told, some things we need to get better in? Do we always like that? I know I don't always like that. So, But we need that so we can become the people God wants us to become. Well, God bless you and thank you all for coming up here. And today, if you wish, there's regular, regular chocolate bars here if you would like one. They're all regular chocolate. No, no dark chocolate. No dark chocolates in here. Would you like her? Okay, all right. Got tons of gum at home, so you're prepared. Well, God bless you all, and you may go with Miss Janet down at the end. At this time, I would like to invite uh, Russ Romanoff from Hope Rescue Mission to come forward and share a mission moment with us at this time. Good morning. I'm sure you're all looking in your bulletin and seeing that Sherry Gillenbosky Golombeski will be here to talk to us today. Um, she wasn't able to make it, and so we're happy to have Russ Romanoff come instead. He told me this morning that, I, I don't think this was an easy feat for him, he told me this morning that he has four boys and a dog who didn't want to leave him, have him leave the house. So we welcome you, and we thank you for taking the time to come to visit Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jane Foster. Uh, thank you, Reverend. Um, thank you for the whole congregation. Uh, I will say it is a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, you're right. I do have four boys. Uh, my oldest one is, uh, is going to be 10 in June, and my youngest one is going to be, um, well, he turned four in January. So my, my wife and I have a handful. But, you know, praise the Lord. I, I just love how you guys had the the young Christians, the young disciples, you know, that really puts a joy in my heart. Um, I'm glad that we have young people to continue the mission of what Christ has called us to. Um, I love it. You guys have such a beautiful church. Wow. It's, um, it's amazing. Um, I pulled into the parking lot and just hearing the bells and it's amazing. Um, so Christ is risen. Um, we, I really try to remind myself every day not only around Easter but you know that Christ is risen and because Christ is risen we have our mission becomes so much clearer our purpose becomes so much clearer what we're here for um, so once again Jane thank you and yeah the reason Sherry um, Golombowski who's our volunteer coordinator could not be here her, her, her mother is um, is uh, really going through a difficult time so it was a uh, I had Sherry's a, a she's our what a great person she is. She's been such a blessing for us at Hope Rescue Mission and coordinating volunteers. And um, she's just, I can't say enough of positive things about her. So it was so, not, even a, not even an issue filling in for her. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Hope Rescue Mission and what our, what we're, you know, what our purpose is and why, why the Lord has us do what we do. Um, Hope Rescue Mission is obviously, it's a, We've been, it's a men's shelter that's been around since 1894. It's been around, we're going on, what, 130 years. And up until recently, it was only, we only were serving men in Berks County. Those that are uh, facing homelessness and just uh, really facing difficult times. Um, but by the grace of God here in last year, we actually opened up a women and children's shelter. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with that, but it's a, it's a really big need in the greater Berks in the city of Reading um, that women and children really have, uh, really have a, a need a place to go. Um, you know, as interesting as it sounds, but men have more resources than women and children do in Berks County. So that was a need that, that God placed in our heart and you know, through, through help and through um, support churches as you at St. John's, um, we were able to do it. Hope Rescue Mission is a privately funded organization. We don't take government dollars. And one of the main reasons for that is because we can bring Christ 
to the people that come through our doors, uh, which is very important, you know. Um, so, and and our mission statement at Hope Rescue Mission is is very simple. You know, we came, we sat down as a team and we really came um, came up with a mission statement. We thought about it. We prayed about it. Um, you know, is really to we exist to show compassion, to empower and transform. So, what you guys, I just wanted to see, let you know how. For example, a church like St. John's and your generosity and the great folks that are willing to give something of theirs, whether it's be monetary, whether it's be volunteering, whether it's just given, you know, uh, 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 some clothing and or even to pray. I really, I really believe that the church of Christ, the, church, the body of Christ, every person, every member, as the Bible speaks about, is able to do something. And if, if the only thing you can do is prayer, that is not an only thing. Prayer is amazing. Prayer moves mountains, the Bible tells us. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that support. I know whichever one you're doing, I wanted to say thank you. It's not about just giving something of, of uh, physical or monetary. Praying is a huge, huge thing that you can do. So by giving clothing, by doing something physical, you are getting, showing compassion by us allowing those men that are going through a difficult time, maybe that lost their job or maybe had a divorce or maybe came across and really um, got in some trouble with substance abuse, anything. You know, there's so many things that could happen. It really, since uh, myself working there, I've been there since about 2019 in uh, various roles. Um, right now I do, I deal, I'm the operations director there. Um, it really, working at Hope Rescue Mission has really taught me Humility, number one, that all of us are equal in the eyes of God. Like we read that, we understand that, but working there, understanding, it really hones the message. We are all equal in the eyes of God. Nobody is better than anybody else. We are all the same. And it just really, uh, I, I really enjoy that. In, a, in an interesting way, working at Hope Rescue Mission has, hopefully, you know, I, I guess I can't say until I come before the, the, uh, before Christ himself, you know, before the pearly gates, as they say, I think hopefully it made me into a better Christian. That's, which is a beautiful thing. If your workplace can do that, that's a, that's a big deal. And I think mine has. Um, so we show that compassion to empower and transform. We, we feed our men 365 days a year. You know, we provide them food, shelter, clothing, very important, you know. A lot of a lot of our guests that come through our doors, you, you know, un unfortunately, they the clothes on their back is the only thing they have, and even then, it's not not in the best condition sometimes. Um, so that's that's what our you know, like I mentioned, we're privately funded. That's why the donors are such a big deal to us because they allow our guests to be empowered. Just going, being able to have a nice clean shower, coming in and taking a fresh shower is a huge deal. A lot of times it's, been, it's a huge deal to be just freshened up. You know, those of us that have the comforts of home and we are able to take a shower once a day, some of us take a shower twice a day. So can you imagine if you maybe somebody went on a camping trip or something and just not having to have like a nice clean home shower, like makes you appreciate the little things, really does. I know, just being so, and then we give them a fresh clothing or even just like nice, used clothing that's washed and clean. I'm telling you, it goes a million miles for dignity. Um, so the Lord has been really blessing Hope Rescue Mission. Um, like I said, we just last year, we opened the Lighthouse Women and Children's Center, which is, uh, we have 43 private rooms for women and children. That is, like I said, mentioned earlier, it's such a huge need in Berks County. Very, very big need. Um, and thanks be to God, you know, we were able to be a partner in that. Um, also, we have, um, we've been really uh, trying to, speaking of empowerment, our men, we've also started a, a program called Hope, Hope Works, which is basically a transition of year where men that maybe were either incarcerated or for, for whatever reason had a, a lapse in employment. Maybe they um, needed some work skill lessons to, you know, what is it to, wake up in the morning, what does it show up 
you know, to your shift to accomplish what you're supposed to do for the day. And a lot of our men have, you know, really have a lot of good transformational stories where they started working. And then on our behalf, whether it's our leadership or somebody in the community that we know, hey, this gentleman, you know, has been consistently working. And we reach out to maybe a workplace or an organization and we say, hey, would you be, you know, would you be available to hire this person? And a lot of times these individuals get hired, get a job, start making an income. They can stay with us for, you know, for various uh, time, whether it's for three months or six months, up to a year. Men can stay at Hope Rescue Mission and that allows them to save money. You know, we feed them, we clothe them, we do their, we have laundry services. So literally the guys that r want to make a life change and, and they make an effort to do so, a lot of, we have a lot of great stories where men come there, broken, rebuild their lives and, and, and become productive citizens of society, which is the goal. And while in the process, we also have classes, you know, we have chapel every night, we have uh, different classes, we have life skills classes, and in the process, our goal is that they meet Christ. Because even if we have, we don't have much in life, but if we know Jesus Christ, that already is enough. That's, that's, that's a foundation that we need in our life, and, and that gives us hope to carry on. Um, so also recently, I'll just, uh, I'm going to be wrapping up here shortly, but we also recently, by the grace of God, we, um, we were donated two uh, parcels of land where we have an extension of transitional housing for men, the men that maybe have been working, have been doing everything right, but they're not quite ready to move out by themselves. Okay, we have a group, uh, um, a group home where men could go and basically and pay program fees and be connected, they could live there. It's uh, fairly close enough to Hope Rescue Mission on, uh, on, on uh, South 9th Street in, in Greater Reading, and which a bus goes by there, you know, and th basically the men that live there, some of them either have full-time jobs or some of those men have a uh, fixed income that they were able to acquire and get the documentation worked out with the case managers, and they come and volunteer. You know, we have somebody that does ground, somebody that uh, works in the laundry, somebody that helps out in our support staff. Um, so it's so the Lord's just been good to us. Uh, we really feel like how how God has been just so graceful to us through and 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 through the hands and feet, which is you you folks, you great folks that help us out, that help us. We couldn't do it on our by ourselves. Uh, I, I know that for sure. Seeing you know being there for about five years, I <laughs> I can testify for a fact we could not do it on our own. We could not. It's uh, the simple truth. Um, so, in conclusion, I just wanted to say specifically, so I've seen Ms. Foster, thank you so much for your kindness. Um, she just, uh, show, even i seen walking in, there is some clothing and she says that's not all of it, um, that you guys just donated to us, okay? So I wanted to give you the practical application, what happens with that clothing, what happens with those donations that you guys graciously give us, okay? so. Right now we have about 160 men, in fact a little bit more, staying with us. 160 men at the Mission Men's Center, which where I work. Hope Rescue Mission is a, you know, is a, is basically the organization and has the missions, the men, uh, the Mission Men's Center. We have 160 men there. We opened up a Women and Children's Center, which right now uh, we opened that in about October of last year. We were actually planning to open that earlier, but COVID, I'm sure. Many of you can attest, really mess things up, really backtrack things a, a few years, but by the grace of God, we are able, able to open Women and Children's Center. So that's at eight, about at 80% capacity. Like I mentioned, it has 43 private rooms for women and children. So in the winter time, we have as many as, you know, this past winter, I think we had 200, 250 men staying at the men's center. So do the math. And then we have an additional seven guys that already moved out and are living at a Hope House. So you can see just how many individuals we have. We're not dealing with 20 individuals. We're not dealing with 50. We're dealing, if you, if you do the math, we're, we're pushing 300. Okay? And, you know, and, and everybody needs clothing. But that, and then you, we're not even counting the children. So the clothes that we have right away, you know, a lot of times uh, it gets processed. Okay, it, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the clothing that we get is already clean. You know, we, surprisingly, a lot of the condition of the belongings we get is very clean. 
Um, if it's not, obviously we wash it, we sort it. Um, so we have a, um, in our thrift distribution, uh, her name is Diane, she's our director of thrift um, distribution. So we have, a, we have a men's, like if you will, closet where, where men that come in right off the bat, you know, we able, they, they come take a shower and then they're able to go and we give them a voucher, okay? And they're able to go and pick out the clothing that they need, whether it's a pair of pants, whether it's some sneakers, um, you know, whether it's just a belt, Come, speaking of dignity, you know, just a pair of socks and an undergarment a shirt is such a big deal, just having something fresh and new. Um, so they're able to get that and they're able to right away for the very first night that they're at Hope Rescue Mission, they're able to wear something and have, and have fresh clothing. Um, same thing, we just recently um, completing like a closet for the women and children's um, center. We, we literally, when we were uh, building our Lighthouse Women and Children Center, our construction company um, basically gave us, uh, gifted us a 53 foot uh, trailer, like a truck trailer that we converted into a, a closet, if you will. So women and children are able to do the same thing, go and pick clothing. Um, we have over 30 donation bins throughout Berks County. If you go to our website, um, it's just hopeforreading.org spelled out you can see all the locations of where our donation bins are, okay? So not, not, nothing, nothing goes to waste. Um, even, even the clothing that we are not able, sometimes if we're not able to use it, or if maybe, um, so we do what's called credentials. So we bail some of that clothing, okay? And then we, 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 we've really been working to develop with like business partners. So if, if they're willing to pay for that, then that money goes directly back to Hope Rescue Mission. Like I said, we're privately funded. We, you know, we, we really, everything goes, try to, you know, have everything resource to help us, you know, our client, clientele, our population the most. Okay. Um, so, wow. I, 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 I almost feel like I, I, I want to preach and I'm excited just to be here, <laughs> but I know, I know I got to wrap that up. So the main bottom line is folks, it's truly a pleasure to be here. Just being in the beautiful church, and you know, loving people. When I when I came in here, you know, like my spirit is at peace because you know you're in the house of the Lord. That's the bottom line. And um, and even knowing that these folks really want to help the cause is huge. It's paramount. So um, thank you for praying for us. Thank you for your support, Jane. Thank you. Uh, what are, you guys have a wonderful uh, parishioner and Miss Foster. She's, she's great, you know. Um, so God bless you all. Um, I, I know all myself I'll be leaving here shortly because I got to actually go to my church, which starts at 11. Um, but any questions, uh, feel free. You know, you, Jane, if you can't get a hold of Sherry, somebody, shoot me a text. I'll connect you with the right any. Just basically, I want to be a conduit to, to be of help. Thank you for having me. God bless you all. Thank you, Reverend, once again. God bless you, too. Yes, thank you, sir. Didn't, didn't Russ do a nice job explaining what's happening at Hope Rescue Mission? And uh, so God bless you and your mission and ministry. And uh, we will now continue with our worship service. In our scripture lesson this morning, we hear about a scroll that was found by construction workers who were rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians several decades prior. The king orders that the scroll be sent to a prophet to determine if the words are authoritative for Israel or not. The prophet Hulda is found, and she determines that the words apply to Israel and are to be heeded. Scholars believe that this scroll's message is now contained in the biblical book we call Deuteronomy. This is our reading from 2 Kings, chapter 22, verses 3 to 20. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan the secretary, son of Azaliah, son of Meshalam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to the high priest Hilkiah, and have him add up the entire sum of the silver that has been brought into the house of the Lord that the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. Let it be given into the hand of the workers 
who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Let them give it to the workers who are at the house of the Lord repairing the house, that is, to the carpenters, to the builders, to the masons, and let them use it to buy timber and quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked from them for the silver that is delivered into their hand, for they deal honestly. The high priest Hilkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. When Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. Then Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have melted down the silver that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Shaphan the secretary informed the king, the priest Hilkiah has given me a book. Shaphan then read it aloud to the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded the priest Hilkiah, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Akbor, son of Mukiah, Shaphan the secretary, and the king's servant, Asiah, saying, Go inquire the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our ancestors did not obey the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So the priest Hilkiah, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Asiah went to the prophet Huldah, the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva and Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She resided in Jerusalem in the second quarter where they consulted her. She declared to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord, I will indeed bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Because they have abandoned me and have made offerings to other gods, so that they have provoked me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But as to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard. Because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring on this place. They took the message back to the king.
You may be seated. And I'm, uh, I'm going to nominate Cindy for an honorary master's yes. degree of divinity for that amazingly sound and well done reading. Yes, you're, you're an honorary member of the master's degree of divinity with that one. Wow. Tomorrow is the 128th running of the Boston Marathon. And um, right now there's about 40% um, of those who run are women. And uh, in all races like that, it's about 60% women. But there was a time when it was not like that. There was a time in, before 1966 when only men were allowed to run the Boston Marathon. Women were only allowed to run races of one and a half miles because that's well all they could do. <laughs> they were the weaker, fairer sex. However, in 1966, a um, woman, um, uh, Gina Bibby, uh, snuck in and ran it and finished ahead of two thirds of the men. The next year, in 1967, uh, somebody actually officially entered in it uh, Kathleen uh, Schwitzer, along with her coach and her boyfriend. And the coach didn't think she could do it either. I had to show her through training that she was a candidate for it. But they signed up, and in the beginning, she was wearing this white, uh, this gray hoodie and, and sweatpants, and she was going to run the whole thing in that. And um, some people saw that she looked like a woman, and so, so she, they said, you know, hey, way to go. Some were saying that. Uh, however, when it got found out, which these things do by the head of the race, that a woman was running in it, he got in the van and went after her and got out and ran her down and tried to swipe the number off the back of her number, of her jersey. Well, he missed, and then um, her boyfriend, uh, an All-American football player, made sure he didn't get a second chance at that. And I think he ate some asphalt. I think that's to put it politely. And she finished the race in four hours and 20 some minutes. She had entered her name, her first initial K Schweitzer, and that's how she got in. It wasn't until four years later before women could openly sign their name and get in, even though there was no rule against this. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that women are allowed to run in the Boston Marathon, right? Isn't that a good thing? That women are much more included in life? that the gender's not held against them? I hope you agree with me on that. <laughs> but as I think about it, I wonder, are, am I and we who think like that, are we a product of our time? Are we a product of those who have gone before who worked that out? That we just naturally assume that. But I was thinking, you know, I'm almost 64, and um, if I was back in 1967 at age 64, would I still think like I do now? I'd have been born before the First World War. I'd have been born before women had the right to vote. Would I have thought in 1967 at my age now that yes, women should be running. You should be running, girl. Way to go. Or would I have been like some of the hate mail that she got? You should not be doing this. This is not what women do. As you think about it, how much are we a product of the times? And are there maybe times and places where we're called to be ahead of our times? Even if we get pushback, even if people don't always like what we think, because we're ahead of our time. In our reading today, um, thank you again, again, I won't give you the doctorate, but a, a master of divinity, you at least got what I got. Because you did a better job than I would have done, for sure. Um, here is the woman Hulda. Um, she was in the, the 600 BC, somewhere in the name when she prophesied. And the backstory is, is that um, King Hosai, who came to king, became a king at eight years old because his father and grandfather were so corrupt that they were removed. And at 18 years old, the story picks up that they're rebuilding the temple that the Babylonians had destroyed or really damaged. And in the process, the construction workers had found this scroll and uh, some scroll with laws in it. And so the priest brings it to King Hosiah, and King Hosiah says, read it to me. And he tears his clothes because it's a word of judgment against Israel. And he's wondering, is this authoritative or not? Does it, does it apply today or not? 
And so he says, go find a prophet. Go find a prophet to interpret what's going on. Does it apply today or not? Well, so the priest and his, his royal priesthood and, and senior advisors, they go looking for a, a prophet and they find Huldah. And they give it to Huldah and she interprets it for him. Did you catch what she says? I love what she says in the beginning, talking to the king. Go tell that man that sent you. Now she's talking about King Hosiah who has the sword in his hand, life and death in his hand. You go tell that man who sent you that this is a word of judgment and it does apply. It does apply and it's going to happen. But also then, and then she softens it up some, but then she goes, you tell the king of Israel that it doesn't apply to you because when you came to the throne, you began reforming, turning away from the other gods and goddesses and worshiping them to bring back the worship of God and rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the ways of God. And so you will die after a good long reign and it won't happen until after you. Well, so they go back and they say that word and, and I guess King Hosiah was very relieved at that, but judgment's coming. And as I think about this dialogue, it's interesting to me, um, one, because it's a historical note, scholars think that this scroll that they found became what we call Deuteronomy. And that's the book of laws, or one of the book of laws in, in the old, what we call the Old Testament. And so here's Huldah, a woman a prophet, determining the first, we believe, the first part of the official canon of the Torah. That God used a woman. Of, imagine that, God using a woman. But then I think, too, the amazing thing is that same point, God using a woman. That God is no respecter of people. That God will use whoever and wherever and however God wants, whatever package God wants, God will use that person if God, they're in God's plans. Regardless of the time, regardless whether it's in season or out of season, regardless of whether it's common sense or it's not common sense, that God uses whoever God wills. One of the things that Russ said, I think, was that one of the things he liked is that in Christ we're all equal. Remember when he said that? In Christ we're all equal. We might find ourselves on many different paths, many different difficult paths or easy paths, but we're all equal in Christ. That, I think, is the second portion that we need to remember, that God calls whomever God wills and sees that it's the person, not the package, that matters. What's most impressive to me, though, is the men. You know, not only that was Hulda a woman in a man's world, but the men, the way they responded. That, you know, they didn't go, well, you know, the king didn't go, well, you know, we should get a second opinion because, you know, this was a woman prophet. Didn't do that. Didn't go, you know, hey, maybe, didn't go, hey, we couldn't find any men prophets, so we'll just have to use Huldah. Um, there was, Zephaniah was there, and Habakkuk was there at that time, and the superstar Jeremiah prophet was there. But they went to this woman, and they listened to what the woman said, and they obeyed it. And I think that is the most amazing thing, that these men, this king and these high senior officials in a very sexist time, with the role of women so much below men, that they listen to this word from this woman because that's what really mattered. It wasn't the package it came in, it was the fact that it came through this person. And I think they were a people of, of ahead of their time, how we're called to be. As you think about it, as you think about it, how do we deal with the isms? We're mainly focusing here on sexism, but racism or intellectualism or or handicap, or ableism, or religiousism, or nationalityism? Do we let these isms form and shape our understanding? Or do we see the package beneath the package to the person, like the King Hosiah and his senior officials were able to do in that moment? In some ways, I think we're a product of our time when we're like that. In some ways, I think we're a product ahead of our time when we're able to do that, because I still think we live in a world that struggles and suffers from some of the isms. How about it? In the New Testament, in the New Testament, St. Paul, what is kind of a, an occasional thing in what we call the Old Testament. In the New Testament, St. Paul says this in, a, in uh, Galatians, in Christ there is no male or female. In Christ there is no slave or free. 
In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. In Paul's days, these were the three significant categories that ruled society. And when you were a male, you were above the female. And when you were free, you were above the slave. And when, depending on where you sat, when you were a Jew, you're a Jew, you're above the Gentile. When you were a Gentile, you were a Gentile above the Jew. But there were these stratifications, and the church was a place of radical differences. Because in there, we were saying that the, in Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, and that these barriers, that these walls that, that kept people separate were to come down so that they could be one people. Imagine the struggle of the early church that was so stratified with this and this to somehow think now we're this. The early people who were slave owners had a hard time. Men of wealth had a hard time being in the early church because they were just, but we can't hang out with these people. We can't treat them as equals. The church still is struggling with that, is it not? So this is one of the places that, not that we aren't male and female, um, slave and free, sadly, there are still slaves in the world, and Jew and Gentile, but really that these things don't matter anymore in Christ, just like Russ said, just like Russ said. Can we see the person inside the package? In many ways, we're ahead of our time if we can do that in some of the packages. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've been told I'm a big white male. Is that true? I've been told that. Uh, who knew? But I'll, I'll say this. In my life, and growing up in the time that I did, um, other men, you can feel me out on this if this is true or not. I can only count on maybe a couple hands the times I've been mistreated, disrespected. And sometimes I look down at the little person, I go, are you talking to me? And I bring this up because as I just thought everyone lived like that. But as I grew up and talked to people of, of, of women and people of other colors and hues, they did not experience that kind of life in the workplace, in the marketplace, in buying a house in this community or that community, or even in the church. Um, women not being respected as well as men in those environments. Is that true? Is that true? I've heard from many people that it is. This is where the church is called to be different, with a different message and with a different way of being. That it might be like that out there in the world, but it's not going to be like that here. One other place in the New Testament that I want to share is with, um, and then finish, is uh, with Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is on his way to the cross for you and for me and all the people of the world. And on the way, he stops at Mary and Martha's house. And you remember, maybe we'll remember this story. Uh, Martha is in the back doing the woman's work of fixing the meal and being head of the house and the kitchen. And Mary is right at the feet of Jesus learning from Jesus because he's teaching and preaching. And while um, Mary is struggling back there, or Martha is struggling in the back, getting this meal together for who knows how many people, um, and you know, really isn't that overrated, all that? It, it's not that much work to put a meal together for, say, 20 people, is it? I mean, come on. How hard can it be? There's always dominoes. Come on. But she's back there struggling. You know, you just see her sweating the pots and pans. She, it's never going to get done. I need help. She goes out, sticks her head out to the window and goes, Jesus, you've got to get Mary to come to me and help me. We ain't going to eat. You're not going to eat. And Jesus says, oh, yeah, that's right. Mary, go back there and do it. No. He says, Martha, what, you, what you're saying is not unimportant, but Mary has chosen the better portion, and it's not going to be taken away from her. Jesus taught and associated with women disciples, and that was radical in his day. There was a Pharisee prayer that basically said, dear, dear God, thank you, you did not make me a woman. And Jesus, by associating with and teaching and working alongside women, he was saying something very radical, that my family, these things, these gen we're different genders, but we're same and equals around me. 
Is this something we can say amen to with our lips and with our lives? This is a, a well-known, a not a well-known, rather, prophet, Huldah. Did anybody ever hear of her before? Yeah. So if you are interested, Marie and I are talking about in the fall having a series on lesser-known characters in the Bible and the messages that they might be sharing. If you appreciated this message and this day uh, and you would like to see maybe a series in the fall of these lesser-known characters, please let me know. And um, let us go out with the word from Huldah. The word is this, that God is no respecter of people and that it's the person inside that matters, not the package, and that we are ahead of our time even today if we're open to seeing other people of all stripes and hues like that. And it's a blessing. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. O God, who has made all of us in Christ a royal priesthood, not just some, that we may offer to you prayer and intercession of all sorts and conditions of peoples, hear us as we pray. For all who toil in the burden and the heat of the day, that they may enjoy the rewards of their industry, that they may not be defrauded or cheated of their due, and that, they never, may, that may we never cease to be mindful of our indebtedness to them. For those who have the authority and power over others, that they may not use it for selfish advantage, but be guided to do justice and to love mercy. Don't let us abuse our power over others and our positions of privilege either. For rulers of nations, that they may act wisely and without pride, may seek to promote peace among peoples and establish justice in our common lot. As king of all nations, we hope and pray, Jesus, that you work in this world to bring about a lesser of destructions, beginning in the Middle East and entering in our backyards. For teachers and ministers of the word, for artists and interpreters of our spiritual life, that they may rightly divide the word of truth and not be tempted by pride or greed or any other passion to corrupt the truth as they understand it and are committed to. On this day, we give thanks for prophets and seers and saints who awaken us from our sloth and blindness, that we may continue to hold their torches high in the world, darkened by prejudice and sin, and be ever obedient to this vision of the kingdom. May it be inspirations to us to be more levels of fruitfulness and faithfulness. Again, we pray for this world. That's much that's wrong with it, but you are still the ruler yet, Help us to believe that, and more than that, act on it. O Lord, who has bound us together in this bundle of life, give us grace to understand how our lives depend upon the courage, the industry, the honesty, the integrity of others, that we may be mindful of their needs, grateful for their faithfulness, and faithfulness to our responsibilities to them. Help that be so. And now I invite you out loud or silently to share who and what's on your heart. Dear God, in the quiet of this moment, help each one of us here sense your presence among us and within us, that when we leave here, we'll be renewed and refreshed to be your people and know that you are with us each and every day. Here is where we pray, not only in our name, but in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On that note, let us rise as we are able for our closing hymn.
Here are our mothers and here are our brothers round Jesus Christ. As we leave here today, let us be God's people in the world because God, the world needs to hear this message and see it lived out, does it not? As you go, you do not go alone or empty-handed, for as always the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is with you now and forever. Go in peace to serve the Lord after our posting.